get together. Um, after you get your, your lunch, eat, let's, uh, let's just meet for a couple of seconds to kind of talk about planning on when we can get together, all right? Titus chapter number 2, look at verse 11 with me. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a, pe a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your love for us and thank you for sending Christ for us. And we pray for your help and your wisdom as we seek to overcome the worldly lust, the ungodliness that is uh, all around us, uh, overwhelming us at times. And uh, we pray that you'd help us in this area and endeavor of, of overcoming the lust of the world. We ask for your blessing this morning. We pray for your guidance and direction. And we pray that you'd bless those might be listening in this morning through YouTube or Skype. We pray that you would uh, continue to draw folks to yourself. Uh, through all of these means, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, and um, again, last week we talked about vessel, uh, con, uh, possessing our vessel in honor. And if I could just kind of rephrase that uh, and, and kind of reiterate it this morning, it, was, it would be this, will you choose to live right? Will you choose what is right in your living? All right, so uh, will we reach forth under those things which are before, press toward the mark? And this week we're looking at this question, are we willing to uh, uh, reject what is wrong, right? Now, here's the challenge. Sometimes we, we see what, we, what, what is right, and we, yeah, I want that. We've got to turn loose of what was wrong to get a hold of what is right. We can't hold on to two things that are going opposite directions. So last week, we, we rejected, uh, we, we accepted what was right, but this week, we need to reject what is wrong. And, uh, and so this week, are you willing to reject the wrong? Are we willing to abstain? Are we willing to do what's necessary to tell ourselves no? And isn't that the difficulty? Telling ourselves no, right? Um, you know, there's, there's a few folks around here that have been trying to do different diet plans. My hat's off to you. I think that's, you know, phenomenal. It's a great self-discipline. And that's really well what it is, is it not? I mean, I, uh, it, it's really about telling yourself no. And this, that, that in the physical realm, this in the spiritual realm, we, it's the same discipline. It's the same idea uh, and in, our, in Titus here, we see, he says, denying ungodliness and worldliness. It's something that we have to actively choose to say, no, I don't want to, that in my life. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be around that. I don't want that to be a part of me. And uh, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Notice it says in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly. What is soberly? In control of yourself. If you're not sober, you're not in control of yourself, your thoughts, your actions, uh, any of it. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It is possible I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it, there is no battle and there's no challenge to it. We'll look at the battle part of it uh, in, the, in the other question that we're going to get to either today or, or in the future weeks. But um, the, the truth of the matter is it really is a choice. I, you know, I have pretty much give up sweet tea. I mean, pretty much. Not... 100% trying to control myself. You know what the nemesis of a guy who's trying to control himself on sweet tea is? A pitcher of sweet tea in the refrigerator. That's the nemesis. That's the, you know, I mean, don't do that, right? 
don't, don't put that in there. And here comes one of my beautiful children yesterday with a great big glass of sweet tea, set it down on my desk. Made some sweet tea for you, Dad. Oh, you have to. I mean, right? <laughs> well, pour it out under the Lord like David did, right? Just, just dump it out. <laughs> I didn't do that. I drank it. But I didn't go back for a second one. I just drank the one that they brought me. Oh, you know, Father's Day's coming, right? Oh, my kids love me so much. You know what they do for Father's Day? Almost without fail, buy me a bunch of candy and put it in my desk drawer in my office at home. So that while I'm studying late at night on Saturday night, Here's your sweet tea, Dad. <laughs> oh, but I love them. Some people come to my house for dinner, and they sit down and go, Wow, look at that. I said, I know it's tough to be on a diet plan around here. <laughs> it's tough. Man, the food that gets cooked and the stuff that's provided, God is good to me. But anyway, the question is, are we willing to reject wrong? Are we willing to have self-discipline and self-control and say no to self and, and yes to God? Denying ungodliness. What is ungodliness? Well, the, the, I, I realize it's probably one of those things goes without saying, but does it? I think it's good if we say it. That way we can't deny it. No excusing it. Asabia, that's the Greek word. And it means impiety, that is wickedness, ungodliness, things that are not. Ungodly is the opposite of godly. You understand that, right? That's what the un part means. It's like saying not godly, right? So we're to reject anything that is not godlike. Or think about it like this, anything that God does not like. We shouldn't like, right? So we're to deny, reject the things that are not like God or the things that God does not like. Romans chapter number 1, look with me, verse 18. Romans 1, 18. It says, For the wrath of God, <laughs> you know it's not good when it starts out like that. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, an unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, understand something. H how many of y'all want the wrath of God? Anybody sign up for that deal? <laughs> I didn't think so. We don't want that. And understand this, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against how much ungodliness? All of it. Now listen, I don't want to be in that camp when the fire comes down, right? I, back in the Old Testament when Moses was leading the people and he said, hey, y'all come on this side and let them be on that side. And then the earth opened up and swallowed them whole. You didn't want to be on that side, right? It's funny, the next day they blamed it on Moses. You killed all them people. <laughs> Wait a minute. I didn't open up the earth. God did that, remember? Let's not forget what happened here. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. God hates it, and he has declared wrath against it, all of it. And that should be incentive enough to say, you know what, that's not good, right? Right? That's not good. I saw something here recently. Um, and you, you, the, I'm told, the scientists are telling us, that sh it, cancer cells feed on sugar. Did you know that? That's what it says. I mean, that's what the, the research said, and I've heard that before, but they just came out with a study that says that cancer cells feed, unlike any other cells in the human body, feed on, on sugar. Glucose. Man. 
That's tough. Say, yeah, well, we're going to use saccharin or some of the cancer-causing agent like that. <laughs> oh. You know, the solution is just self-control. That's the solution. You need to have a balanced diet, right? Not an overabundance of any of that stuff. And uh, we'll probably be just fine. I quit, quit using a whole lot of sugar. I use honey now instead. I know, I know, I know. Isn't, but isn't that what we do? We substitute one bad thing for another bad thing. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We need to deny that. Look, you're at Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 6 with me real briefly. Romans chapter 6. And look starting in verse number 1 there. <clears throat> it says, what shall, we what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, you know, some people say, well, God understands. Well, you know, God paid for sin. Well, I'm saved, so all my sin's covered. And Paul writes, shall we, continue, shall we say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into, Christ, into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the gr glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We also should walk in newness of life. You, you see the, the should there. This is what we should do. And the, and the question is, will we? Will we deny ourselves of the fleshly lusts and the ungodliness of men and will we walk in newness of life? For verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We shouldn't serve sin. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Um, we need to deny, we need to resist, we need to put off, we need to stop the ungodliness and the worldly lusts. Uh, that's the counsel. And the question again is, will we do that? You know, back in 1 John chapter 2, it says in verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know, all of these verses and all of these thoughts really are centered around one thing. Let's choose right. Let's deny the wrong. And again, you can't hold on to both sides. You've got to turn loose of one to get a hold of the other right? I, I can't eat, keep eating bowls full of ice cream every night and expect to lose weight, right? Help me out here. That's right. I can't be drinking pitcher after pitcher of sweet tea and think, well, I'm going to lose some weight. This just won't work that way. By the way, I have, it has been paying off little by little. I'm, I'm at the slow pace coming down, right? It's, it's, it's coming off, but it's, it's like, Doctors say you're not supposed to do it in a hurry, right? It'll just put it all back on. So I'm just trying to take it in my time. It took me years to put all this weight on, so it's, I'm, I'm just going to have to take a little time to get it all off. Monkeying around in this barn is helping me, I'll tell you that. It is helping me. Um, my kid said the other day, Dad, we didn't think you could climb like that. <laughs> I didn't want you to ever know it, neither. <laughs> I can't help it now. We didn't realize you liked it up there. Don't, don't be dwelling on that thought a whole lot. I still don't like it up there. But anyway, it'll, it'll be all right. We got to do what we got to do. Um, if we're going to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts in our lives, 
the key to that is abstinence. Abstinence. Um, learning to tell yourself no. Look with me at First Peter. First Peter and chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 11. You know, it's, it's interesting, Paul often uses this phrase, dearly beloved, usually when he's about to say something really tough. <laughs> now, friends, let me tell you, dearly beloved, he writes, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, notice, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. Abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain from fleshly lusts. You know, I, again, I have great respect for some of you, some of you have, have lost, dropped a lot of weight, and man, that's great. Um, how did you do it? You told yourself no. No, I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to eat that much. We need to do the same thing. It's the same principle for worldly lusts. We see and identify, hey, that's something that God would not like. That's something that... Most of it, you don't have to be told that God doesn't like it. You know God doesn't like it. We just need to start saying no to ourselves. Abstaining from fleshly lusts. Notice it says there in the end of that verse, which war against the soul. You know, the world that we live in right now, there is full... <clears throat> of, let's call them moderate Christians. I'm trying to hold on to both things. Well, I don't want to get too far this way, then they won't talk to me. And they, I, Man, I don't want to let go of God because then I'm, you know, that's no good. Friends, I realize the time we live in. It's, it's very similar to a time long ago when a man lay, named Lot cast his tent towards Sodom. It's very similar to that time. And the arguments that get used today are very similar to the arguments that Lot used when he moved his family into the walls of the city. I've got to sell my sheep somewhere. These people pay good money. Oh, you want to marry my daughter? Okay, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Man, these people around here are wicked. What's the matter with these people? Meanwhile, Abraham's up on the mountain on the other side saying, God, please don't destroy them. If there's just this many, if there's just this many, if there's just this many. And finally, Abraham, get, have you ever realized this? Abraham got down to just the size of Lot's family, his household. If you can find just this many, would you? Yep, for that many, I won't destroy it. God could not even Lot's house. Do you realize? We're going to talk about mercy in the afternoon service today. You know what happened to Lot's wife? Well, we all know she turned into a pill or salt, but do you know why? She turned her back on the mercy of God. We'll look at that a little bit this afternoon, but it's, it's about abstinence. This is not good. That's not godly. This is not the way it's supposed to be. According to the, the Bible, the, the environment that Lot put himself in vexed his righteous soul, which should have been indicative of, let's get out of here. 
right? Let's not be a part of this. <clears throat> but he didn't abstain, and he lost his entire family and his testimony to boot. So the question that we need to ask if we're going to have victory over, uh, over lust is will I long for and will I choose right and will I at the same time reject what's wrong? <clears throat> and, I, and I know that's a battle, but let me ask you a third question this morning. I have time to get to this third question. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would have you turn again to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. If you follow me to 1 Peter, you're not far away. <clears throat> 1 John chapter, or yeah, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And let me present this, and, and I don't know if you've realized this or not, but really all of these things, all these questions are pointing to the same thing, our relationship with God. If you will maintain your relationship with God the way it should be, all of these things will fall away. If we don't maintain, if we, if we instead maintain a relationship with the world, all these things will be a bigger challenge for us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, <clears throat> and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. <clears throat> And all I can say is if John thought there was many antichrists in his day, he, <laughs> he'd need to take his shoes off today. Because, wow, is it a wicked time that we live in. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. Because if you love the world, the love of God is not in you. That's not my words, that's his words. We can't hold on to both things. Here, here's the question that we need to answer, this, this third and final question that I want to propose to you. Who do you love? Who do you love? You're going to choose wrong or right? We'll know who you love by what you do. <clears throat> See, we need to consider, there is a conflict. There is a battle raging within every single one of us because you were born in the flesh and raised in the flesh, and that's all we think about is our flesh. I mean, when you get hungry, you eat. When you get thirsty, you drink. Let me present an idea to you. This, I don't know, this, this, I think it might help you. It might help your kids or your grandkids. How many of you all have an open pantry policy in your home? I mean... Anytime anybody in the house wants to, they can just walk by and snatch anything they want and consume it. Is that the policy? <laughs> some saying yes, some saying no. Is that the reality, though? For a lot, isn't it? Oh, I'm kind of hungry. I wonder what we got.
And then maybe by chance you got young people in your house who walk by the... Oh, or you catch them in the fridge. What are you doing? Well, I'm hungry. Supper time's coming. And as they walk away, you're sneaking in there. Why y'all laughing? Yeah. See, it's, I'm just trying to help you understand something. This is ingrained in us. When a little baby cries, what do we do? Feed it. Check its diet. Make sure it's comfortable. Make sure it's got everything. It's, I mean, but it's not, that's the right thing, isn't it? Sure. It just, it, at some point, it needs to stop along the way. You need to say, it's not lunchtime yet. It's not supper time yet. Right? But isn't it easy to get in the cycle of just walking past and saying, oh, yeah, I'll have one of them right now, and I'll have one of them later, and we just, we're consuming. And we've trained ourselves to be consumers. And that's why it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We need to identify that and say, okay, I need to have abstinence. I need to control myself. I need to see when enough is enough. And notice in James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, in, is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. <clears throat> this conflict that's going on within us. Our flesh says, I want more. I want this. I want that. I, I, don't deny me. And we have to say no. We do need to train our kids to hold back. We do need to train our kids to hold back. But we also need to maintain that ourselves. We need to choose wisely. Choose who we love. Do we love the world, the things in the world, the things of the world? Do we love self or do we love God? And that is a conflict. There's a battle that rages there. But we need to consider and choose wisely. See, because God calls us to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, touch not the unclean thing. <clears throat> right? You could probably finish that for me. That's in 2 Corinthians. I'm turning there because I want to read the whole passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says in verse 14, be, not un, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Can I bring something else into this? Just to see, you know, we, we've talked about food and drink and things like that. Th this text brings into it another concept. Who are you going to marry? I hope that it's not really something you're dwelling on a whole lot. I do. You shouldn't be thinking about that a whole bunch. Good that you're shaking your head. No. But I mean, it does cross your mind occasionally that sometime in the future, God might provide a spouse for me to right off into the sunset with. Yeah? <laughs> Some of them are saying. <clears throat> but you have to choose carefully. Because who that person is will greatly determine your future. 
success or failure. And that's who are we going to yoke up with? By the way, it doesn't just, it's not just talking about marital unions. It's not just talking about who you're going to marry. It's also talking about business unions. If you go to work at Walmart, what can you not expect to have happen? I know. I thought it was an easy because I said, okay, praise God, you got a job, but I'm not going to see you here on Sundays anymore. Now, I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I, I just want you to understand who you make connections with in the world, whether it's a job or a marriage or just a friendship. You got to be careful who you make these connections with. It really comes down to who do you love? Because if they don't love God, whoever they happen to be, whatever entity or person that happens to be, if they don't love God, you're heading in the wrong direction with this. Oh, but I love them. Oh, but the pay is good. But we have a lot in common. Be careful, friend. I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm, I want to be real with you. This is the battle and this is the choice that we must make because each and every one of those decisions will put you either closer or further away from to God. They will either isolate you and insulate you from lust or they will put it right in your lap again second corinthians 6 being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness what communion hath light with darkness what concord what connection has christ with belial that's satan what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? That's somebody that doesn't believe. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. See, we've come back to you are the temple. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, verse 17, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And ye shall be my, uh, and will be a father unto you, rather, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I want you to remember this. Every person has a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. And that needs to be a part of the calculation of the decision factor when it comes to who am I going to connect myself with? In, in any level of relationship, right? I can go into the store. I didn't put any tracks in my pocket this morning. And I can go and, and go to the checkout and hand the person a gospel track. Now I'm interacting with that person. But that doesn't tie me into anything, right? But if I say, hey, you got a business, I got a business, let's join our businesses, and now all of a sudden I'm tied. Or if I find a lady, bearing in mind that I would be single if I was looking, right? By the way, how do you know I love my wife? I'm still with her. That's a good point. But I don't go around flirting with every other woman. Would that show my wife that I love her? 
No, it sure would not. It might show me a knot on my head too. <laughs> Be careful. I say, well, I'm a single young guy and there's a single young gal and she's pretty and I'm ugly, so this works out pretty good. Be careful who you make eyes with. Be careful who you think about signing a covenant with, contract with, making a connection with. Because this thing of lust, it'll either help you. Remember, they war against your soul. So the questions are, will you reject what's wrong? Will you choose what's right? And who do you love? Who do you love? We got 10 minutes to the hour. We'll, we'll get into some more practical things. If, if, we, if you, we can imagine more practical, I'm going to try to present some more practical ideas in the next lesson in a couple weeks. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for the day. Father, it is difficult. We live in, it's not a city of Sodom and Gomorrah anymore. It seems like the whole world is a Sodom and Gomorrah. It is filth on every corner, at every turn, no matter where you look. We need your grace and mercy and help. Father, I pray that you'd give us strength and boldness to say yes to what's right and no to what's wrong. Help us to choose wisely and choose to love you more than any and all else, including self. Help us to practice abstinence and turn away from the things of the world. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You got 10 minutes, 9 minutes. Good to see all those of you that just.